welcome back to Life Under Deborah's Palm. As usual, you can hit the like, subscribe, share, notification bell, check out my novel, check out my website, you know. If you've been here, you heard the drill. Today what I'm going to do is continue with the Who is Jesus series by looking at Jesus as what is called the second Adam, and sometimes they call it the last Adam. And this, I think, is going to be the end of this series, although we'll always be talking about who Jesus is, but this was kind of concentrated on that one thing. And so I am going to start with Adam. Let's take a look at Adam. You know, Genesis, God takes the dirt and makes man and he breathes into him and he gives him life. He has a garden, he puts Adam in the garden, he gives him Eve, and all's good for a little while, you know. Adam has a covenant with God. Now, there's covenants all through the Bible. There's just tons of covenants in the Bible. The language of the Bible doesn't say covenant, but the elements of covenant are there. There has to be two parties. There's God and Adam. There has to be rules. God gives the rules. There's also um, consequences for breaking it or benefits for keeping it. So in this case, God lays it out. It's really pretty simple. I am going to read this to you out of Genesis 2, 15 through 17. All right, and it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, Eden to work with... Oh my gosh. Let me try that again. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So there's the covenant. Me and you, we're going to hang out in the garden and be pals. You can have anything in the garden. Anything you want except one thing. And if you eat that one thing, your consequence is you will die. So now we move on to the serpent, also known as the devil, sometimes called the snake, whatever you want to call him. He's hanging out in the garden. Along comes Eve, and he starts a conversation with her. And now Eve's first problem is... You shouldn't be talking to him to begin with. She should have just slapped that tongue and gone on. But she got engaged with him in his conversation. And in the conversation, the, the devil or serpent or whatever you want to call him begins to sow a seed of doubt into Eve. Oh, did God really say you couldn't eat from this hair tree? Are you sure that's what he said? And she says, nope, can't do it. Well, you know what? The reason God doesn't want you eating from that tree is because when you eat it, you'll be enlightened and smart and you'll be like God. And that's why he's keeping it from you. Okay? Eve gets suckered by that. She gets drawn in. She eats it, gives it to Adam, who, by the way, was standing right there. Okay? Gives it to Adam. He eats it. Now, God comes out looking for him because... They hung out all the time, and he finds them hiding, and they explain that they're hiding because they're naked. They had no way of knowing they were naked, so God already knows they've eaten from the tree. So now they've broke the covenant. Well, the breaking of the covenant has a consequence, and the consequences weren't just for Adam and Eve. It was for humanity. We are all living with the consequences of Adam and Eve's choice. They've broken covenant. Now there's a consequence. And the first, I'll say person, that God's going to slap around is the snake. So he says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Those last two verses, or, yeah, they're two ver two, I guess it's a, okay, let me start that again. The last two lines that I just read where it says, he will, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel, that 
starts talking about Jesus. So Eve is the mother of all, and eventually everybody will come from her in one way or another. And, and God's already saying, there's another man coming, and you might have suckered Adam and Eve out of this, but I got someone else in mind, and you won't be able to defeat him. He will crush your head. So the crushing of the head, which sounds really kind of weird, really means the crushing of his headship or his ability to rule or lead. That's what that means. The striking of the heel was the crucifixion. The devil thought he had him. He thought he won. Well, guess what? He didn't. And now Jesus is back and what he had, he's given to everybody if they want it. So that broke that headship. That's what that part's about. So now we're going to move on to... All right, the next person God deals out the consequence to is Eve. And he says, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will give birth to children, yet your desire and longing will be for your husband, and he will rule with authority over you and be responsible for you. So what happened to Eve is her headship changed, where God was it, now it was switching over to Adam. It was now going to be Adam that was going to tell her kind of how what to do it, and how they were going to live. And then lastly, Adam gets his spanking. And lastly, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife, headship, get it? God was the head and, and Adam let it go. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. They're eating from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from brought a curse on the ground, like literally the soil, as well as humanity. It allowed Satan to get a foothold. See, he didn't have authority until he talked Adam and Eve into giving it to him. Their disobedience switched authority from God to this serpent, okay? And they didn't, he didn't have it until that time. Now we got a problem, and there's a chasm now between man and God. God didn't desert Adam and Eve. He was still with them, but their life just went from paradise to real hard, real quick. The second Adam, or as I said, sometimes called the last Adam, and I'm going to read to you out of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 through 49, and this is what Paul wrote about it. He said, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those, are, sorry, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. So what Paul is saying is Adam came, he was an earthly guy, and then Jesus came and he's a spiritual guy. And what happens now is those of us from Jesus' time forward, we have the option to be both. We're automatically born like Adam. You ever hear the, the concept of original sin? That's what it is. And so we were born naturally that way. Now there's a spiritual guy, Jesus, who is allowing us an or giving us an option. We don't have to live completely like that. We can be spiritual beings as Jesus was, 
It's our choice though. None of us are forced into it. God does not have robots. He has children. Choice is always there. So a little comparison from Adam to Jesus. So Adam's creation really was a supernatural thing. God scooped up dirt and breathed into it and created a man after his own image. Jesus also had a supernatural creation through Holy Spirit. The reason that it was done that way was so that Jesus would be born without original sin. He would not have the sin of Adam in his lineage. That was the point. Adam's testing in his covenant was simply not to touch the tree. And he failed. And here we are. But that chasm is about to be bridged by Jesus. Now Jesus also had to pass some tests. He goes to the Jordan, probably about 30 years old, and John baptizes him, and it says the Spirit descends on him like a dove. And John saw it happen. And then it says, like, immediately the Spirit takes him to the wilderness where he is tested or tempted for 40 days. Now, in the 40 days, he's also fasting. So at the end of 40 days, when he's probably at his weakest and ready for some food, who shows up? The serpent. So the Satan shows up and he begins to start with him. Now, understand, the devil knows this guy's coming. He doesn't understand everything because if he did, he never would have had him crucified. But he knows he's looking for somebody who's going to steal his kingdom. And he's, he knows it's Jesus. He's got it. So he's out to do the same thing to Jesus as he did to Adam and Eve. Now chat him up and see if he can get them to give their authority, really, to lose their dominion. So, first thing he says is, well, you know, he knows he's the son of God. And he's like, well, he, make those stones bread and you can eat. And Jesus goes, no. Now, Jesus quotes scripture at him and he says, you know, man doesn't live by bread alone. So he goes, well, okay. You know, it's written that you could jump off this cliff and your foot wouldn't even strike a stone. So go ahead, son of God, jump off and prove it, is basically what he says in the passage. And Jesus goes, no, you don't put the Lord your God to the test. Notice I said Satan quotes scripture. Careful. And then the last thing he says is, he shows him all the kingdoms and the wealth of the world and the earth. And he says, all of this is yours. I'll give it to you if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, away, just go. And then the angels come. And from there, Jesus begins his ministry. So he's passed that first series of tests that were really intense compared to not touching a tree. But now the crucifixion is looming and Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane going, you know, God, if you can take this away, by all means, take it away, but not my will yours. Jesus knows he's going to be beaten, whipped, tortured, crucified, mocked, everything else. He has the option. He had a choice just like we all do, but he chose the right thing and where Adam's disobedience allowed sin to enter the world Jesus obedience allowed us to be free from that if we choose he will cover all the garbage we've ever done in our life and free us from the curse of Adam and that's pretty big doings for us. We have an option. We don't have to live under the curse. Jesus, you know, Adam started the curse with a tree, picking, eating fruit off a tree he wasn't supposed to eat. Jesus ended this curse. The second Adam, the last Adam ended it by being, they say, hung on a tree, nailed to a cross, to the wood. You know, the option will be yours. It always is. Like I said earlier, God doesn't make robots. He makes children. Choices are completely yours. But that's kind of the first and second Adam, Old Testament, New Testament, or Old Covenant and New Covenant. 
And that is, I think, going to be the end of this. And I, I hope you'll go back and read the scriptures and learn things for yourself and meditate on it through the week. So until next time, have a great day and be blessed.